Thanks so much for coming on the show, Ed. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> um, it's a real pleasure. I guess what I want to start off with, just a very uh, a simple but straightforward question. You are a former heavyweight boxer. So I think one thing that would be interesting for people to hear is um, what are some lessons from the boxing ring that you've carried with you into your everyday life? Um, you know, fighting is a is a really miserable thing. And I, and I wish people really understood that. There, there's this really weird point where you're not, you're not doing it because it's cool. And you're not doing it because you make money. You're, you're stuck in this weird middle. Mm. And, and being able to work through that and really fall in love with a process, not a an outcome that mm. is a really big lesson i mean mm. like i don't i don't know if i could come up with any bigger lesson than that i mean there are there are a few i mean i try to talk about a lot, a lot of the things that that i experienced and learned in fighting but but i'll tell you this man like you you learn that it doesn't really matter if you're in pain it doesn't really matter if you got rent due or something like that you you have to pull your entire being and focus it on the opponent in front of you. Otherwise, it's it's wasted time because you'll just get hurt and lose. You'd be better off not doing it. But if you accept that this is what you want to do, then that's mm-hmm. just part of the game. you got to stay focused and you have to, to approach it with this focus. If you have yeah. that focus, life is going to be very good for you. If you don't, uh, you know... Boxing has got a great negative feedback mechanism. You don't you don't make the same mistake twice, and you don't and you definitely don't make it a third time. You won't survive. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that that seriousness of approach is something that is it, it's it's just you can't get it really anywhere else. I think mm. uh, if there are, there aren't other places, yes, there are other places where you can develop you know a disciplined approach. But there, there. I don't think there's anywhere outside of fighting sports where you can maybe like com, um, special forces training, where yeah. you where you pay a very real visceral price for making a mistake, and that gives you a really new respect for humans as well. Right, right. I think. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things there. Uh, you talked about the process. I was reading. Um, What's the book? Uh, oh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Uh, the Mark Manson book, you know, like the airport book everyone has around. Yeah. And one of the points in there, it's like a pop psychology book. Um, one of the points in there was, you know, life is always going to be hard, or you know, for whatever reason, like um, people are upset because they're single. People are upset because they're in a relationship. People have money problems because they don't have any money. People have money problems when they have too much money. Um, and the idea is like, there's always, it's always going to be a struggle. So just like choosing to really devote yourself to something. It's like the, it's like the Greek process of like eudaimonia, you know, like being yeah. fulfilled. It's not you, fun, you know, fucking jumping rope in the gym right. all the time. Yeah. And, and I wish people understood that, that, it, that life is, I think one of the greatest mistakes we've made in this generation is that we we think life is about feeling good right life is about avoiding pain right no yeah. that, that is not life mm. like like think about most of society or not most of society most of our time on this planet it was not spent in air conditioning with food immediately immediately at the ready and sitting hygiene. in these comfortable chairs yeah, yeah like, like this is a very new thing and we are yeah. not designed for it you know no yeah, you're you're one. Of, I mean, it's yeah. Mark Manson's point was like, pick your heart. You know, you're right. Whatever you're gonna do, it's gonna be fucking difficult. Like, if um, it's worthwhile, it will be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think boxing is is such a good example because it's like, it does. It hurts all the time. You're constantly pushing your body to physical limits. The other the other thing, uh, you know, you you alluded to before is that there's that instant feedback loop. Um, and it's like, you don't, you don't want to make the same mistake twice because you could get very seriously injured. But a lot of people today, um, in my opinion, anyway, uh, 
whatever that's worth. Uh, <laughs> sort of, we don't like to learn from our mistakes. People go out, you know, get hammered, do drugs, whatever, do something stupid, yep. and then what's the solution? Is like hair of the dog, start drinking again. Um, or, uh, you know, people work, work on jobs they hate or they stay in relationships that they shouldn't be staying in. Um, and it's sort of, it's sort of like, you know, cognitive dissonance reduction. You're waiting in line outside the Apple store at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> whatever, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And you're like, I can't get out of line. I already waited two hours. It's like, no, well, get the fuck out of line. If you don't want to be there. <laughs> you right. Know? And, and here's the, here's my thought process is, is it goes towards this choose your heart or whatever anything worth doing is is going to be unpleasant i would even argue that that unpleasantness is a is a feature not a bug and that's what really weeds out a lot of people from wanting it because because i really believe that like <clears throat> if you it, it, let's say there was like this genie and he he showed up and he was like yeah i'm gonna give you everything you want all you got to do is starve, suffer, and deal with a bunch of people who die. Uh, mm. Maybe you lose your leg or something. But you got to go through this for seven years. Let's let's say seven mm. years, right? So you, so you have to put up with immense pain, struggle, and you still got to work for it. But I'm gonna make it easy. I'm gonna make it easier. You won't have to work as hard, but you're gonna get it. I still think it would that that pain and that that misery. It's gonna turn a lot of people off. I mean, we live in we live in the instant gratification era. And I think one of the one of the best things that happened Tommy was I had no control over is is being born a millennial hmm. and not a younger millennial you know an older one because I know the old world <laughs> for hmm. lack of a better term yeah. you know we're the last generation of children who who couldn't look things up immediately yeah. and you straddle the two you straddle yeah you know and and we had to take risk and there was and things weren't quick if you missed something you missed it there was i mean i think about now like like we, i talk about game of thrones a lot in this regard there'll yeah. never be another game of thrones for better or worse uh, because no one's trying to sit and wait every week like right. like shows can't do that i mean they, some of them try but they just can't because yeah. you've gotten so used to things coming quick things coming easy and mm. that can't well we're not can't it's not good for your ethic and the way you approach things one yeah. of the great things about fighting is is i mean it, it, there's just no way to become good quickly i mean even if you're super talented you're still going to go out there and put in a lot of amateur fights to hone it, it because you don't because you still fighting is is so many things at once that even a, even a true great talent is just athletic. He's still got to go out mm. there and, like, calm his mind down, train his mind to react to things. I guess there's two different things. His neurosystem uh, to react to things, keep his temperament calm, be able to move under pressure, train his body to, to, to exert itself uh, very at a very high level over a long period of time. All of those yeah. things, that's, that's hard and long. And, and it's mm. not fun. I mean, I, dude, I hated training. <laughs> Um, I mean, training. I, I like the result of training, and I, I like yeah. losing my mind and and um, like the the patterns and and seeing myself improve. But yeah. but I found things to love mm. about it because because when you look like when you look at the the way fighting is set up, I'm gonna train for forty to fifty hours a week. I mean, and that's not an exaggeration, okay? And what am I doing it for? For a fight that if I do my job shouldn't last more than twenty, maybe thirty minutes. It's a hard it's hard, man. Yeah. Like, you don't see the results. Every day is miserable. You you hate and dude, I didn't even have to go to the dieting part. I wouldn't I don't even yeah. I was a heavyweight. So yeah. I don't I don't even know what that would be like. That would yeah. probably be uh just as miserable, if not yeah. more miserable. <laughs> It's it's not it's not glamorous. It's not you know it's not like you know, you, you watch the movies Rocky or Creed or whatever and people think you know or it, nothing is glamorous though. Um, yeah. No one who's really successful at what they do lives nearly 
as much of a glamorized life as as one would think because the truth is people who produce something cool something unique or who are doing something cool and unique bust their asses for it. some people are luckier than yes. others some some people start life on third base but at the end of the day like um you got, you know, you, you, you got to grind. And it's about, I mean, you said this, like, um, it's about having a sense of purpose. It's not about instant gratification. It's not about just, you know, someone had in their bio the other day, the only pain I want in my life is champagne. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I, yeah. I do. I've never heard yeah. that before. No, nah, it's funny. But like, no, I fundamentally disagree with that, even as a joke, because like you need pain. You want, I, I want to be in pain. Like, you know, in order, not as a masochist, but like yeah. in order to be advancing whatever I'm working on, like um, well, that sense of fulfillment of, of being in like a flow state, you know, of being just like working towards something, building something. Yeah, um, yeah you know what's up? What, what, that, but the, there's no way. That's the thing. This is why I like competition. And, and you noted, you'll, you'll notice that, that I think one of the things... Um, I, I wish there was another word for them, but they're just the left. Uh, one of the things that, that is very big now in that line of thinking is, mm. is eliminating these these demarcations of competition, whether it be body positivity or, or you know, the tax the rich. The, all these ways... A quality to, of outcome. Yeah, they want a quality of outcome. Quality of outcome, outcome not a quality, not a quality of, opportunity. of opportunity. Yeah. Right? And and I think a lot of that does come down to wanting to avoid pain. Like, like it's very hard for the average person to imagine. Uh, like, I, I can't imagine. Uh, and, and I guess technically I have more money than the average person. Uh, I can't imagine what it's like to have a million dollars or a billion yeah. dollars. But I know what it's like to work for money. Like, yeah. So I'd never be like, let me go take that guy's money and tax him. Like, no, nah, as I, I look at it, I have the complete opposite reaction. I'm like, wow, if you're able to make a billion dollars and give all these people jobs, you know, maybe we should just leave you alone. Like, you won. No tax for you. That's your reward. I was like, <laughs> that, that's my thought, right? Yeah. And, and it, yeah. I have the same reaction to, to, like, ideas around body positivity because aside mm -hmm. from it, it, it not being uh, good for you, it's ugly, and mm. and I think that there's something very um, primal in us. We appreciate beauty. It's very mathematical what makes something beautiful. You mean like morally or physic? Like it's. I mean both. Aesthetically. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean I mean absolutely both. But if but if we want to talk like most practical, the aesthetic beauty of a thing, <laughs> we really. And but but you see yeah. this if, if you look at the the architecture that survived. From like the 15th and 16th century, the, Ro the Romantic pro period, and that architecture, and Victorian, it's beautiful. We love the way things look. It's not just yeah. about physical beauty. Modernity has taken all of that away, and now we're trying to take it away from the body. The ones who resist, because humans aren't going to change. Look, I I'm still yeah. going to walk around, you know, 14, 15% body fat, even less if I can help it, and still be jacked and work out. I'm not, I would never, like, like, yeah, the dad bought, what, I, I couldn't imagine that. But, the, but they push yeah. that idea because that, that's easy. That's what it is. It's yeah. easy. And well, they also, I think the idea is that the, uh, the people who promulgate these ideas are, they, they don't just want it for themselves. They want, it's, it's like, I want everyone to change how it's like asking the rest of society to change how they think or how they feel to accommodate an extreme you know an extreme minority it, 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 particularly on the on the, the the body positivity thing it's like i'm not wrong for being obese the rest of society Boy. is wrong for making me feel bad for being obese it's like no but one of one of the i was talking with um you know zuby he's a he's a rapper yeah i, was, I, know zuby. Yeah, I was talking with zuby the other day um on the on the podcast that episode's not out yet um and one of the things he you know he wrote this book on like weightlifting um and one of the things i sort of went off about or went on a little tangent about was that um it's not that like a lot of people's problems in life could be solved if they just went to the fucking gym make oh, your bed so make, true. make your bed in the morning <laughs> and go to the gym you don't need gender reassignment surgery, you, probably. 
You probably don't need, you know, to take all kinds of pills for depression. You probably don't need to, you know, ask the rest of society to bend over backwards to fit your beauty standards. You need to take care of yourself and, you know, like tend to your own garden. Take care of what's in your space. It's, it's a profoundly selfish and narcissistic thing to do to ask the rest of the world to change, you know, whatever, what the benchmark is um, so that you can feel good. As you said earlier, it's not about feeling good. You shouldn't feel good. I, I've been overweight. I, you know what? A couple weeks ago, I... I, I gained five or ten pounds because I was I was drinking and I was eating shit. I was eating a lot of hamburgers, pizza, whatever. And then you know I, I I go to the gym five days a week. But I was like, oh wow, like I don't feel good. I don't like you know I don't I don't feel great. I'm gonna start doing a lot more cardio. I'm gonna clean up my diet. Then you're not gonna Lo believe behold, this, right? Yeah. Lo and behold, I started feeling better. Like what a concept, you know? You know what's um, crazy, man? Look, I I tell people all the time. If you want to like change or improve your life, the very first thing you should start doing is going to the gym. A hundred percent. Because, because it, a lot of people don't have, or I would say most people don't have experience watching something happen over the long term. Certainly not in the modern era. It, it's not even a thing anymore. So when you go to the gym and you watch your body change, you see what's possible with applied effort over time if you're consistent. Right? That's a good point. That's an and, excellent point. And not only do you see it, other people can see and react to it, so it starts changing your mind. Like, like I think the last, uh, you know, battalion of hope or bastion of hope is are our athletes because mm. they fundamentally, what I've been thinking about it, it's like innate almost. If 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 there was a way to put something in you that wasn't there before, and call it innate, ingrained. It's ingrained in them the the value of consistency which is just uh sustained effort over time and great point. emphasis great point. on the time part hmm. and if you do that a lot of things can change absolutely absolutely it's um i mean it's a philosophy for investing you know all these people want wanted to do these get rich quick schemes or like, <laughs> yeah, they, they do get rich quick schemes only but work on, on the lazy. Like I'm convinced Man. of it. There, there's a great song uh, a while ago by this this British group called The Streets, and they it was called um, Honest John. And the, the the chorus goes, "You can't con an honest John, and honest John is hard to con." And and they they break down like why in the, in the lyrics, and pretty much what it comes down to is it's very hard to take advantage of truly honest people. Uh, Whenever you, whenever someone, what do you mean? It, so, whenever someone is operating from from a true sense of altruism or a true sense of of goodness, as we'll call it, which is uh, loosely defined as not uh, is um not an emphasis on self interest. The other person yeah. is first, yeah. or contributions to their their uh, surroundings or neighborhood or environment mm -hmm. is first. Those people are hard to take advantage of. Because they're not trying to get anything, like mm. like you you don't have any leverage to lead them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, when yeah. someone is trying to get over, when they're trying to quickly gain something, those are easy marks. They're easy targets. Greed is what makes almost every single person fall yeah, into a Ponzi sure. scheme or con con artist Yeah, it, it's not the people who like it, it's it, no one is invested in in the latest Ponzi scheme who's about like. Uh, saving orphans or some shit like they're like you know <laughs> are going out and giving money to the homeless because because their minds just don't work that way. Mm. I guess yeah. honesty and greed can coexist though. You can be greedy and honest, and you, you, you certainly can be honest can. about the fact that you are greedy. Like you could just tell everyone, I, I don't care about anything but making money. Or I oh <laughs> sure, but, but think about what's going to happen when you do that. Well, for starters, you're going to repel a lot of people you could work with. So it's not in your best interest to, yeah, to do that way. It's like a Patrick Bateman <laughs> sociopath kind of... No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So the guys who... The real con men bullshit artists are always like... 
they end up entrapping themselves because they go for the shiny. Because they're all yeah. I, I understand what you're. I understand what you're saying. It seems they almost like sell themselves a little bit on the bullshit too. Like they. Oh, they, you they, have they, to. They know. What, yeah. You, yeah. You look. Hey, I, I I have an even an even deeper kind of belief about this. I think the most effective con people. Uh, they 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 don't see themselves as bad. I think it would yeah, be very hard for, yeah, for them I've to do the job. Then, yeah, <laughs> the greatest con, and I, I've written about this, um, the greatest con you can pull is to convince yourself that you're not a con man. Yeah, if, if you do that, then, you, then, then you're going to operate. I, I was trying to explain this to, to somebody, and, and young people, whatever, they, they're young. I mean, that's what it is, right? Um, that's me. <laughs> yeah. I was I was trying to explain. I was said that a person who has good intentions is almost always going to do the worst, the most damage, mm-hmm. or, or at least more damage than someone uh, who is operating. And this is a weird kind of paradox, right? Because we just talked about how greed makes you more susceptible to being conned and hustled. But there's another end to that, and I think this stuff must exist along a spectrum. Because if you have really good intentions, you start, you can justify a lot of bad shit. Like, if you think it's, and we see this, we actually see this modernly today. I really believe the people who think that the First Amendment in the United States is is a bad idea. I really believe they're operating from a position of these what these words are being said uh, or, or people are, are inciting violence or bigotry or whatever through their words. The problem is that's so short-sighted that you have to be... You, you almost have to have good intentions in place of intelligence to think that's a good idea. Mm. I, I, You're preaching to the choir here, Ed. I, the, first, <laughs> the first column I wrote for Quillette was called... Noble intentions, counterproductive results, and it, among other things, looked at approaches to metropolitan governance uh, in, in in cities across America. And like these these, the you look at cities with high crime, low literacy, uh, high poverty rates in America, and a lot of them, uh, or some of them anyway, the cities that we're looking at have been run by Democrats for like the last fifty years. Why is it that year in and year out, you know, people's lives aren't getting better, but they keep voting in the same the same people? It's like the intention. You want to help people. You want to lift people out of poverty. You know, that's a nice idea. Um, if you want to help people, the the short answer is hurt them. You know, well, yeah, <laughs> well, the, well, that's, that's the thing. I, I Social always... welfare, the cycles of dependence, the whole the whole thing. It's like it comes from a good place. I don't want to see, you know, guys in the street corner not able to afford rent. I don't want to see guys dropping out of high school, you know, getting into crime, whatever. But if you really want to help people, you can't just keep them, like, supplicant. Yeah. Um, it's an extreme way of looking at it, but, you, you know, you know what I don't, it's, it's not extreme, though. It, it, all it is is it's looking more than one order of effect ahead, and people in general aren't intelligent enough to do that. So, yeah. so, so uh, here's a great example. I, I often argue back with people who talk about uh, raising the minimum wage. I'm like, do you understand when you raise that, you're cutting off a section of people who would work or who could work and are worth that much, but now they're not worth that much and the employer doesn't deem it worth it worthwhile to, to make up the difference in what effectively would be a subsidy. So yeah. by raising the unemployment rate or unemployment wage, you over time contribute to fewer people working. And that's just a second order condition that no one, certainly not, at least not the proponents of yes. raising a minimum wage think of. Yes. And, I, and I go, you know, counterintuitively, if you really cared, because this is second order thinking and people are bad at that, if you really cared, you'd push for the abolition of the, 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 the abolishment of the minimum wage and, you'd be, mm. and, and just let skill and bidding wars sort it out. And yeah, it might have hurt at first, but that is the only way people could be guaranteed a wage if everyone operated like a free agent. Mm. And I think. and if you went and you didn't have the skill, you were out the market. You were out the, the labor market. I think, look, I agree with the spirit 
of what you're saying. I, 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 no, I don't know enough about, you know, you know, the federal minimum wage requirements and then based, you know, it, it's been different in different cities in America. But in general, like I agree with the, the spirit of what you're saying is like in the short term, you will be called mean or and cruel. Yes. You'll probably be called racist or you'll be called something. You'll be called a lot of names, right? Um, but if you really want to help people, um, like, it's not about, you know, getting the credit for introducing this massive new, you know, uh, social welfare policy or tax hike or whatever, like, do take the mean approach, take the austerity yeah. approach, and, and be even, called mean, and then, again, magically, wait a little bit of time and people will be lifted out of poverty. Dude, check it out, and, and we don't even have to take this this idea and apply it to, to policy, we can just look at it from a... Um, from an interpersonal relationship standpoint. Yeah. If, if you notice someone is gaining weight, the, sometimes, you know, I, I, there's no nice way to say, look, brother, you're getting a little fat. But you have to say it. Otherwise, you know, in the short term, they'll feel better. In the long term, you're quite literally putting their health at risk. Mm. It's the same with an intervention. And we, we, and we can actually, we can actually, like, identify with that idea a little more easily an intervention if you find out if you see your homies drinking a lot all of a sudden you gotta go look man uh you you become a bit of a drunk and yeah. and there's uh, we're worried about you drinking whatever no nah, you gotta keep it real 100 and get right to the point i tell my girl this all the time in, in her line of work that there's the there's a good reason and the real reason and a lot of times we give the good reason when we're trying to be Nice. I, like, if I notice my girl is losing, gaining weight, I say, hey, you know, for your health, you should lose some weight. That's a good reason, but the real reason is I want to like looking at you when you're naked. Like, that's the real reason. And and the real reason, when you give the real reason, you, you cut off all other avenues of counter-argument. Mm. Because they either have to go, yeah, you're right, or I don't care. But they can't come up with goes like oh i'm healthy to look at my blood work ah, i don't give a shit about that's not the real reason i was saying you know kind of thing how, how does this apply to the policy approach of oh no what i was saying I, I was taking the general idea and just putting it somewhere else so we don't have to apply it to like policy but in but no general, i mean the, this the idea best... of real reason versus good reason like what would be the real reason that you know i don't know you Oh, oh, okay, so like the real reason, but the real you reason... You cut off well, some benefit program. Okay, cut right. off some benefit program. All right, so a good reason we don't do that, or they tell us, is we need to help these people, yeah. right? Yeah. The real reason is these people represent 13% of the vote. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, So, but, but no one's going to say that, but, but, but we make a joke about it every year, you know, and I'm really surprised. That, that's how you know all the politicians, no matter what side they're on. Uh, are all in uh, collusion together because it, it, look, look if I was running I go look man you've been pimping black people forever like I, I, that's all I'd say I don't care who you are that's what I'd say but we only show yeah. up when you need us <laughs> yeah but, but no yeah. one no one wants to call that uh, I'm just being silly though in that regard but, no, but, but, but yeah, the idea I mean, yeah. the idea still stands though that there the good reason is that and people will eat up the good reason if, if it benefits them Hmm. If you tell them the real reason, I, I bet there'd be some kickback. That may, maybe not as much as we expect, but certainly uh, not as much compliance with certain ideas. And we see this all. We, we just saw this with, uh, with 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 everything regarding the pandemic. And I have no idea what the real motive of the pandemic was. Uh, and and I'm not I'm I'm not a super conspiracy bro, but but I and I've gone back and forth, thought about this, put my ass on the line on both sides on social media, just thinking out loud, you know, and and gathering thoughts. But what has become clear to me is that is that there are there is whatever whatever the real reason is, <laughs> uh, the good one they tell us is to stop the the. Sp Spreading of, of the virus and keep people out the hospital and all that good stuff. You and mean the lockdowns, not the yeah, the lockdowns, pandemic. yeah, yeah, the, the, that right. 
I'm I'm not saying that you know yeah obviously you know the the, the pandemic was a real thing and everything it was, it was dangerous. I, I think so. I, yeah. You have to specify <laughs> that these days, man. Yeah. But 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 a lot of the lockdowns and mandates, um, there is the good reason and the real one. And right. and I can't if we're following the real reason, then we should be tracking and moving right along with data. You know what just happened? I thought this was hilarious. Philadelphia tried to reinstate. Uh, the mass mandate. I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm, I, I live in Pennsylvania. So, mm. the, so Philadelphia reinstated the mass mandate, and mm. four days later they dropped it. Now you can't tell me that it's dropped because oh we got a new bit of evidence. I think what happened is enough people weren't. It was just too hard to get people to comply and listen, and then the behavior changed, and so they had to drop it. But if but if the real reason. Was that people were getting sick, and so I see how dangerous that is. Because imagine if 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 it was like a real thing, right? People really were getting sick, uh, and like the, you mean recently? Yeah, or recently. Recent? Yeah. Imagine if that's what was happening, but they had to backtrack because no one was listening. Well, they ruined the credibility by 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 being heavy on emphasis when they didn't have to be, and not giving real reasons um, when. They should have. So now sure. no one, no one trusts to the point where they can't even hold their own line. I, 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 we haven't seen that anywhere else. Where they were like, "Hey, four more days," you know, a four day, four day mask mandate, and then boom, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I think on, on, on the question of lockdowns. I, I live in Australia. I wasn't in, in the United oh, States. That, oh, no <laughs> kidding. You um, don't have an yeah. accent. I thought you were American. I am. I'm calling you from New York. Uh, I grew up in. I grew up. I grew up in America, but I. I've been in Australia for a couple of years, um, and I'm, I'm just back visiting family. Um, so I'm, I'm real curious. Uh, yeah. So so what, that what was portrayed here to the rest of the world uh, was like the, the the cops was was beating everybody's ass down in Australia, and it was crazy. What was it like that? I mean, like, what, what was it really like? No, no. <laughs> Um, there was, it was nothing like that. Uh, that certainly was not my experience. And to the very best of my knowledge, I'm a journalist. So I think I'm rather abreast of what's going on. Um, a lot of the bullshit that you saw in the news about COVID concentration camps and like tanks rolling through the streets and like really dystopian shit is utterly false. We locked down from uh, April, May, June. By the way, the Australian people overwhelmingly supported the lockdowns. Um, this was not... You talk about democracy. This was something they wanted. Um, yes. And they, they voted for. And so continuously and the public no approval kidding. ratings w was really high. And it, it was not at any point... Um, authoritarian in the sense that people you were going to get shot for walking outside of your house, right? <laughs> Did I you think... see some of these videos that they yeah, were showing? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, we, we, and that, that's we, it's crazy to me because because like the idea is like, here's some video evidence. This must be a thing look, that's happening. But I'm, that's not what... I don't have a dog in the... I'm a, I, of course, you know, I support... Uh, liberal Western democracy. I'm a, a, a free market capitalist. I don't like the closures of businesses, um, all this stuff. But um, I, look, man, I, we ran a bunch of coverage on this, um, on the, the myth of Australia's COVID, uh, COVID concentration camps. You saw a lot of garbage coming out of people like Tim Pool. Um, it, it was just, it was just flatly inaccurate. It was just false. Um, and so, or look, you can prove anything that you want to prove assembling the right statistics. Um, yeah, and, I, and, I, and so we're, we're, you know, the army is 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 called in because there's a shortage of police officers. Cause police, I, I don't remember what the specifics were. Um, that happened, but they weren't like going door to door, um, China style, and like <laughs> you know wearing hazmat suits and locking people up. I personally, so. The other thing to understand is that you don't you don't have to agree with it or don't agree with it or not or not agree with it, but it worked. 
Um, we have way, way, way less deaths than, than the United States in Australia. I think now it's only like 6,000 or something in total throughout the last two and a half years. Um, I'll have to double check that statistic. But uh, I was locked down April, May, June of 2020. And then from June of 2020 to June of 2021, my life was essentially normal. Um, so, so, the, so what is being spread out and put out in in the other well pretty much on, on social media right that's not an accurate representation of, of look anything i'm sure going on. I, 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 there are so many sources i couldn't even begin to like i would we'd have to go you you know no sweeping generalizations i can't say everything that you saw was bullshit some of these videos are probably real the real footage happened there were uh protests there there was like you know what this reminds me of but look it also depends where you were you know yeah that's what i was going to say melbourne is statistically the most locked down city in the world i personally hate dan andrews who's the the premier of melbourne (laughs) and i I hate a strong word i wouldn't want to drink a beer with him i'll tell you that though it looks like he's he's a weirdo um Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. It was gray and dreary and people were unhappy there. I never went to Melbourne. The other thing in Australia is that the the states themselves had closed borders. So imagine you live in Pennsylvania. You, you can't go to Michigan. You can't go to New York, Connecticut, whatever. There was no... Huh. There was extru- there were th- there were roadblocks with, with the army, whatever. And so they, they really... They contained and got rid of it quickly the other important part i want to get across about the pandemic because everyone's talking about this now is that hindsight is 2020 you know don't underestimate the incompetence of politicians (laughs) not 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 because they're incompetent of they're they're so stupid it's like they were just figuring it out, man. It's like being in a boxing match. You, you get hit in the face and you learn. We'd never... Be, it's like being in a... Your first live boxing. You've never been in a boxing never match been, before. So you're right? figuring things how out How the, the fuck floor. are we supposed to know how to handle a pandemic, a global pandemic? I mean, you go back... It's hard for people to remember this, but you go back to March of 2020. You start seeing this stuff on the news. Where I went to college at Princeton, kids were outside in the courtyard i was in australia at this time but kids were outside in the courtyards drinking partying they were super excited to have a two-week break off of school the, oh, like right we we all thought this is gonna be ah 10 days is great man i'm gonna go home i'm gonna fucking watch netflix and you know uh have lots of sex with my girlfriend <laughs> it's gonna be so fun it's a vacation right and then it's and not- then and then and then you know more time passes we're like hmm all right Oh, it'll just be a month, and then they'll get it under control. Oh, it'll just be six months. Like, the politicians and the policymakers and the public health officials were running around scrambling to make, you know, to to do what they could. I, I'm not a, so I, I, a COVID the, the, conspiracy. Let me just no, no, I, I'm not. I was, I was going to say. I was just saying I'm not a conspiracy. Uh, no, no, uh, and I, I don't think you are, but a lot of people have this question uh, or have these ideas that there's some, like, evil and nefarious intention to like you know lock everyone up and you know you know come into like a hitlerian style regime um i i don't think that the intent that there's this grand plan or pandemic or whatever like it it happened and we scrambled to figure out how to deal with it to the best of my understanding in the united states and in australia at least uh, the best we could. There are no good answers. Yeah, I think if if you you said something a little while back that I wanted wanted to to address, and I think it's a really good point that you can assemble evidence to support your conclusion, whatever your conclusion is. You can oh, assemble, a bunch yeah. of, or as I like to say, you can convince yourself of anything if yes. you ignore any evidence to the contrary. Yes. And, and one of the, one of the things I have to constantly, and it's like an internal battle, like not just against what I see, but like an internal battle. I have to remember, like I, I, I point, I, I see things that show up. Yeah. And I go, everyone says there is, you know, like like they try to put a plan behind a thing, and I'm like, but that doesn't, but but to what end is what I always make sure I ask myself, and and I'm a, I I don't have. All, I don't have any of the 
the type of journalistic resources or reach you'd have. But I, I do have, thank goodness, a mind that tries to think two and three orders ahead and go, why? And like, just asking that and not yeah. being a, and not being attached to whatever the answer is. But if it if it fits and supports certain things, I go, OK, I I get it. And that and, you know, and how we got to this conversation initially. Right. Uh, when when here in Philadelphia, there was the idea of a four day mass ban and the mass mandate and it's dropped again. My brain goes, why? And literally, oh, the most likely answer is a um, the when, when you say it. incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you say incompetence, I, you know, I, th- I think I think that's a very and that's probably a, a more accurate view of the political uh, of politicians because there there are people just like us, and and I don't know how the the parliament of Australia is composed. But the house here in the United States is mostly lawyers, which I think is really weird. Are people mm. with, a, with a law background? So it's not like like Portugal, for example, where I, where I was in March 2020 when everything happened. We weren't mm. living in Portugal. Um, they have they had a very different approach, but they have a very like intellectually diverse team in their yeah. government. So I thought I thought that was was really interesting. Think about this, Ed. Like I've I, you know I. I, I I worked in government. I worked for congressman. Um, like, uh, think about this. What kind of person goes off and decides that they want to work in government for the rest of their life? It's such a boring <laughs> job. Like, I couldn't think of anything worse than sitting around, you know, in any level of working in a DMV, working at the fucking, you know, post office, the United States post office, working in Congress, working for a state legislature. It is, you know, it's necessary to keep the country running, but But not necessarily. I think they're not smart people because the smart people go off and do something more interesting. Well, you know, there's there's a joke (laughs) I've I've heard circulated that you know all the people not smart enough to go to med school go to law school, which is like probably true. Which is a huge (laughs) gulf in ability. But Uh, but yeah, I always wondered that like what what will motivate someone to want to be a career politician. Like, like I can understand that, that idea. At... Yeah, there's not even there. There was no such thing as a career politician until very recently in history. I mean, I I like the idea of of you know ancient Greece. Even I I think it's ancient. I studied modern history, not ancient history. But like, you know, you would go, you would serve your post. You were like a member of the public. You would serve your post, and then you would step down and go back to being. A yes. blacksmith or a fucking poet or whatever the hell you were doing. Which um, is a great way to represent, you know, the, the personal interest. But when you, when you have a career are, politician, wait, were you just gonna sit around <laughs> drinking stale fucking coffee printed documents all day? Um, hey, look, great. Thank you to the nice, good politicians that exist. But a lot of them are just a bunch of fucking teenagers bumbling around, fucking things up, and um, like we can't forget the fact that they're i have respect for it because they're doing jobs that no one else wants to do eric adams is the mayor of new york he gets a lot of shit i don't personally like him i don't agree with many of his policies and i think new york is not doing great under his leadership but i will say who why was he elected because no one wants to be mayor of new york who would want that job (laughs) that's a great point yeah yeah um, no, it's you, you know you you highlight something that I think is really important that a lot of people forget that these are not overly overly bright like, like I, I'm not even gonna go as far as to like call them stupid because I'm sure they're they're not some of them either. are stupid some of them aren't yeah. I mean there's no monolith yeah I mean, um, all I'm saying is some of these mistakes that we go I mean there's real life consequences for people's lives but. Um, I don't think they come from a nefarious place. I come. I think they come from a place of just of like trying to figure things out, not really having all the answers. Yeah. Um, best best intentions with low <laughs> intelligence or average intelligence uh, tends to tends to lead to some pretty bad points, which goes full p- bad outcomes, which goes full circle to condo what I was saying about when you have great intentions, but but other things are lacking and you just move maybe with those good intentions, uh, you can do quite a lot of damage, I think. Yeah. 
You can. You can. And I, I think the issue with 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 politicians, one thing is that when you make, when you are in the business of public policy, your work affects the lives of other people. You know, what, how many lanes of traffic you put on the highway affects how quickly people yeah. can get to work and then, you know, how many hours they can work, blah, 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 blah. Like, it affects other people's lives. So, I'm not saying these, these people are stupid and I'm also not discounting the plight of you know, small businesses are shut down, you can't pay your rent, you can't pay your mortgage, that sucks. And I'm not saying, well, just forgive the politicians, forgive them, because they were just figuring out. All I'm saying is that the intentions of something like lockdowns or of introducing bike lanes in New York... Um, <laughs> I was no, laughing they, because they did the thing here, too. They did, Yeah, the bike lane, they took yeah. the lane out of traffic, it's such a pain in the ass. But, um... It's like, it's not this nefarious thing. I want to make you late to work. I want to keep you locked in your room. It's like, they tried something and they, you know, like, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Anyway, I, I, we can move past this, but... Yeah. Um, it's been a great conversation so far. I just want to let you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, having, I'm, no, I'm having a ball, man. <laughs> um, no, it's... it's, it's, it's I, I, I think that we shouldn't discount the... The incompetence of politicians is all. <laughs> Ed, what um, what does stoicism mean to you? It means getting in between the stimulus and the response. What is okay? Break that. So, down. so I always tell people, it's not about controlling your emotions because that's really, in my opinion, at least, impossible. Sure. I, you know, you feel angry, you feel frustrated. Are happy, are sad. That is a natural reaction. That's part of being human. You can't mm -hmm. shut that off. But you do have 100% control of what you do with it and how you respond to it. Yeah. So stoicism to me is the system of conditioning your responses to your emotions. And, and you know, that's, I guess, the most general way to put it. If we want to go one layer deeper... It's conditioning your responses to where the to where those responses do not impede your progress in life. Okay. So a lot of people when they get angry tend to do things that when they're not angry they're like, oh shit, that was a problem. Or yeah. even worse, you know, one of the things I had to figure out the way I grew up is, you know, just because somebody says something wild to you, you know, an uncalculated response can get you into a lot of trouble. Because now you got to deal with a fight with a person who doesn't yeah. give a shit. Think about the people in the road rage incidents we have here. At least, at least, at least two or three times a year, someone on the news, and it always makes national news, a road rage incident someone ends in shot. murder. Right. Yeah. But, and and think about what leads to a road rage incident is is someone does something in another car, and you don't know why they. This is most of them. I'm not talking about the people that like. You know, or blatantly thumb up the finger to somebody. But they do something, and you don't know what you don't know their intention. All you know is how it made you feel. And you react to that feeling by, by honking a horn, chasing them, making them feel intimidated. So now they're like, what the hell is going on? So now they're reacting all freaked out. And their response is either going to be to do something wild, like speed off and put everyone else in danger. Or stop and try and square up with you and see if you'll get out. It's it's insanity what happens. Like I'm 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 convinced that nothing good happens when you lose control of your emo of emotions. That's mm -hmm. not to say be emotionless. I never ever promote that. I think emotions are a rich part of life. Without emotions, all your memories are just data points that hold that mean nothing, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it it's like it's the difference between a sketch um, a real life sketch and an impressionist painting, like your 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 emotions add something that makes it worthwhile to remember and experience in this life. But if you mm. let them be the driver, they're supposed to be in the passenger. They're supposed to be the passenger, I guess. Even better, I'll even take that analogy and say they're supposed to be the car, but they are not supposed to be the driver. And right. I think a lot of people make mistakes when they let the emotions sit in the driver's seat. Okay, so. Stoicism is getting the emotions out the driver's seat. Mm. It's not to me. I, I, I think my definition somewhat disagrees with the classical 
idea, but I'm not sure. But I do know that for me personally, I've always defined it and operated as if uh, my emotions don't matter. Right. Because they don't. That's not to say, uh, and when I say they don't matter, uh, I'm not, they matter to me. And, and perhaps they matter to someone who cares about me. But in the grand scheme of things, my emotions are insignificant. What matters is what I do uh, in the world. And if yeah. I, it's, it's like, I, I used to have an old joke. I used to tell guys, I say, you know, marrying, while you're, marrying out of love is the same as killing somebody out of anger. One day you might, might be out of love or out of anger. You got to look back and go, oh, shit, I'm stuck. I'm still in prison, right? And that's a joke, mostly. Uh, mostly, I, I do. I do not believe in marrying just pure love. You should like look at their family and everything else. Like, do your research and everything. Uh, but, but that's what it is to me. Just, just a control of your emotional reactions. That's a good. That's a good way of looking at things. What about? I mean, the chief emotion you seem to be describing though is anger, right? Some guy does something to you. Um, and I've heard you talk about another podcast or YouTube videos or whatever. Part of what you learned growing up was you couldn't just, you know, fly off the handle because you get up getting shot or stabbed or whatever. Yeah, it, it, um, can, it can go badly. And and the other guy, as and you you point out the example of um, the road rage thing. You got no fucking idea what kind of day this person has had. <laughs> and what the they wife, got. The wife, the wife could have just left them. The dog could have just died. You know, they could have just gotten fired. They, their, their co-worker could have just gotten a slightly larger raise. You have no idea. Everyone's, you know, fighting their own battles, going through their own shit. And you, I mean, the example you used was you step on the, the wrong guy's pair of shoes. You step on, <laughs> you fucking bump. I was on the subway the other day. You bump into 10 people, right? Nine out of those 10 people, no problem. And you bump into the one guy who's and he's looking like, the for a fight. And the fuck's problem? And, yeah. and you can respond one of two ways. You can be like, the fuck's your problem back? Or you can be like, yo, my bad, man. Yeah. You know, How hard so, is that, too? <laughs> right. So stay out, yeah. Um, and and you know what's cool? <laughs> you know what's cool about, about you know, this, this brand of stoicism I practice? It makes you more empathetic to people. And and I think that's where right. the real difference... Rather than just saying, fuck you, you're, you're angry, I, you're no longer my friend. You know, it's yeah. like... Maybe, you know, someone that had a bad day. You, you cut people a little more slack. It makes um, you so much more aware of the fact that people are not as strong as you. They have not practiced as much. And this is, this is a nice analogy to kind of boxing. Uh, when I get in the ring with somebody to spar, I, I generally know within 10 seconds, maybe 20, their level of ability. Right. Now it's up to me to decide what we're going to do with that. Mm. If if their level of ability is equal to mine, that means I need to fight hard, but I'm not trying to kill them, right? right? If their level of ability is superior to mine, I I give myself the kind of green light to go all out because I shouldn't have an issue here, and I need to do that to stay up. But if their level of, of ability is inferior to mine, then... It's my responsibility as the better, more controlled fighter to not kill this guy. I need to use this to teach. And if you look at if you look at all your interactions with people as teaching lessons, and I really think they are, then when you start to practice my brand of stoicism, mm. you have to. It, it, it's it's automatic. You you start to see every little thing that happens is is a way to improve the world yeah and 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 that's a weird way to think of it i think because i we, we don't tend to think of not swinging on somebody that most people would swing on as making the world a better place but but in reality you know what have, what have you done well you well you've eliminated an entire timeline where maybe that person loses their freedom and, and their life or you do and all the people that are dependent on that person or you are affected by that and down the line you also open up the possibility for them to calm down and reflect on it later without mm -hmm. having to deal with a, a, a punitive action. There's so much that you can do when you control your emotions. And if that control is driven by or at least supplemented by 
a, 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 a connection, responsibility, and empathy for your fellow man, I, I just think it's a it's a power to change the world. That, that, that's that's one of the reasons why it's kind of my site. I don't have any any articles on my site purely mm. about stoicism. Yeah, I probably should do that, right? Just from an SEO perspective. But but because for me it's 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 not about that. It's about this general kind of responsibility for your emotions, and I do have articles on that. And if you take that and you apply it, you you just you can do so much more than you think just by not fucking shit up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good way of looking at the world. Is that um, you are in your own way making the world a little bit of a better place simply by putting a space between stimulus and reaction yep. a lot of people it's it's instant it's uh, mechanical uh, it's, that, it's, it's muscle back memory. to that instant instant gratification world where man yeah there's, there's another you know what's crazy like like and, and and i i do not claim to be perfect at this i'm always learning and but and you are self-aware which self, is self-awareness is, is, a, is a trait <laughs> That, you know, if you don't have self-awareness, you, you can only really go so far, man. But once you get it, you, you're kind of limitless. At the very least, your limit becomes your lifespan. And yeah. it's, it's a point. <laughs> uh, but, but a lot of times, I, I've i really been training myself lately because I, I don't like this quality in myself, so I want to remove it. Or mm. I will respond to stuff on, on Facebook. Because my Facebook audience, the way Facebook, the interface compared to Twitter... I, I pretty much don't see anything on Twitter. Like, uh, it, but despite having all the followers I have and my activity on the on the, the platform, I hardly see anything because I don't use it that way. Yeah. Facebook, I have a bit more of a consumer relationship with, so I'll yeah. see a thing and go to respond. But it's, I, I'm learning to just look and go. You know what? And, and this this kind of helps. Whatever whatever your tool is to help you do it, you should find it. But I look at somebody say something, and I'll go. The best thing that I can do if I feel bad about this and I would like to retaliate is to remember that your thought process is going to cause you more harm than me. And just leave it be and go away. And it's worked pretty well. I, I had to delete something this morning. <laughs> but but um, other than that, I, I'm, I'm moving pretty well because... And, and, the, and the better I get at it, it it's like a muscle. You, you keep working and keep working and pretty soon I won't even have to think about it. I'll just go, that, 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 that. Oh, this is funny. Let me add some humor. That's what I like to do on social media a lot. If, if you're, I don't know which platform you follow me on, uh, but. Instagram. I, I, oh, so IG. So I, I, I don't I don't put as much humor on IG yet. I, I just put something in my stories where I was messing with somebody on uh, Facebook adding humor. But. Uh, I saw that. <laughs> oh yeah, where the guy was talking about you know about being in kids. jail. Or yeah, 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 that thing, right? And you've seen the reactions. Like I try to make people have a good time and laugh. You know, that's a good, that's a great use of the platform to, to have a ball, man. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people want to use it to argue and fight and antagonize, and I'm just like, dude, let's have a good time. And that, yeah. but I, but but that is getting in in the middle of mm-hmm. my reaction, which is to look at all that stuff and feel like. I have to agree or disagree with it. Mm. But I, I, I really try to get in the middle of that reaction and I go, let me make some people laugh or, or use it to make money. In other words, mm. like I won't, I won't let... That's another thing that happens when you get in the middle of stimulus and response. You, you stop being controlled by the world. You start going, okay, I'm not going to let social media get in my head. I'm going to get in social media and get something out of it, whether it be friendships, connection, money, all kinds of things, but the average person isn't doing that. No, no, they're, just, they're like enslaved to the platform, sort of, just constantly <laughs> scrolling and scrolling. You, you're not even aware. Like, I, I was on my phone, I think, like five hours a day at one point during the pandemic. Wow. Yeah, like, and you know, on the iPhone, there's the uh, screen time. It, it tracks in the background the screen time. Imagine that. Imagine. Like, you know, we because and then you get the number of pickups too. You have uh, five hundred pickups or two hundred pickups today or whatever. Like, imagine if you spent five hours just like at w- in one go, <laughs> but it's never in one go. It's, it's always it's like little hits of 
dopamine and what it's just it's always scroll 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 anyway um the point is is <laughs> if you can make social media work for you rather than you know subconsciously like just like fucking scrolling twitter instagram facebook whatever all the time that's an important thing particularly for young people like i i really do worry um i was worried about this before the pandemic right but all these teenagers, you know, tween, baby, you see babies with iPads and whatnot. But like oh, all goodness. these, all these teenagers. Back in my, you probably remember this. <laughs> back in my, um, <laughs> how old are you? Uh, uh, I'm 24. I'm 24. Oh, but, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure you're a. Um, are, are you Z? I'm. I think I'm Gen Z. Yeah, I missed the millennial cutoff by a, a, the last millennial cutoff by a couple of years, unfortunately. Yeah. So. Oh. I have to wear the Gen Z badge. Um, but, you know, you see teenager... We had AIM back in the day. Like um, I, No, we imagine. had AIM too. I had AIM in high yeah, school. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so it's not like, oh, the new generation is addicted to their phones or whatever. But, like, I do worry about um, the ability of people to communicate and interact with each other in person. Um now because you see kids walking down the hallway cafeteria whatever they're not socializing they're just you know likes and clicks you know follows and whatever that's a a totally different thing (laughs) a story i always tell people to illustrate how different the world is my best friends i I have i have five really good friends Mm -hmm. right and and I met them. I got introduced to their social circle because because part of my, my my origin story is in, in high school. I went to a completely different high school across town where yeah. I didn't know anybody, and it was one of the best things that happened to me. But I, yeah. I had to make new friends. And yeah. so one day in biology class in the ninth grade, me and these this guy we were talking about um, who was better at this video game. We talked trash for a little while, and then we said, "Let's settle it." So we went to the arcade, and the video game, I believe, was Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Yeah. I mean, it might have been just Marvel vs. Capcom 2, might not have yeah. come out yet. But uh, <laughs> we, we went and we settled it at the arcade. And at the arcade, there were other people playing, and there was a whole etiquette we had to observe where we showed up, we put a coin down on the desk to let people know who we had next, and we were moving up. And, and, and there were social rules that you had to figure out in person that apply to the whole world because it were in person. And they're just, they're just not officially enforced, but we enforced them. We figured it out on our own. So I made my, all my, my best friends because of a video game. True. Yeah. But, but it was in person that we dealt with it. We, we didn't go on Xbox live or PlayStation network. We met up in person. We got to know one another's families, things like that. Mm. And that makes a big difference. The, the in-person interaction is, is gone. It, you know, we, we live in a, a rare world today. I have a, I have a girl, um, a friend that I, 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 well, she's a friend now. I dated her. And, and I asked her how she met her latest boyfriend. She goes, how else do you think? I walked up to him. I'm not one of those other millennials. We're seeing you know, where everybody's on, on, you know, swiping and shit. And I think that that's, that's so rare because she, she's like, no, she, she's pretty smack in the millennial uh, time zone. But I wonder, I, I couldn't imagine what the dating scene is like now if you're under. Well, you do. You're I mean, I, you're, yeah. you're a day where everybody is. Is everyone swiping and matching that way? Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't. I don't really use the apps in Australia very much. <laughs> Man, um, the, the, your voice just sounded like the like I, the uh, <laughs> the wares were terrible. <laughs> no, 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 no. The I don't need it <laughs> in Australia. There's oh wow, okay, there's well, there you go. There's, no, there's beautiful girls everywhere, like on every street, every corner. You know, one of the running jokes I have people say, "Why are you in Australia?" I say, "For the weather and the women." Um, and you know, so I, I'm not, I'm not a big hinge bumble guy in Australia, but when I came back to New York, I did re-download the apps and there's, you know, you do the little swiping and all of this. Um, it, it, you know, I do it, but it, it almost feels like, I don't want to say cheating, but it feels like just not. Well, you, well, you know what it is. You know what it is. You know? 
But because because that's a thing we're missing now. There yeah. is something very enjoyable about meeting the new person and, yes. and that interaction. And it and that's and then it's you know, making eye contact across the bar. Or you you know you you walk up to someone in a, in a bookshop. You're both reading the same book. Or like that that's serendipity. That's spontaneity. Like. How'd you meet your husband? Oh, you know, we 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 both had the same pair of shoes. We both had the same <laughs> book. Right, whatever. it makes, it makes what, cool that's story. a cool story. Yeah, um, nothing wrong with the dating apps, but uh, no, I mean, and, and you know, you I know will say cool? you meet people you wouldn't meet. You meet people from across town. You know, if 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 there's I don't know, there's a now there's tr- public transit everywhere, but you meet you can meet someone that you wouldn't otherwise have met. Run into. I live in New York. I live in city. Well, no, I don't live in New York. That's a lie. I live in Sydney. But I grew up in New York, and I'm in New York right now. Um, we eight million people. Yeah, I get on the subway. I see people every day. I'm almost definitely never going to see those people again, just because of the cycle of who, how many people moving in and out at the same time. So it is cool that you're able to connect with people from all five boroughs, in in you know from different backgrounds and walks of life, and you get a little snapshot of. Who they are and what you do, which is, you know, you mentioned lo- love is not enough. That that that's true. You need compatibility, like, um, yeah, lifestyle, I, you lifestyle know preferences. But it it, <laughs> it makes it easier. But look, there's benefits to both. I personally prefer meeting people in person, but there's benefit. I don't know how we got onto this, but there's there's benefits. It's a cool both. thing to say, man. Wherever it goes, you know, yeah. I, you know, I met my girl online ten years ago yeah. when it was cool. Yeah. When it wasn't yeah. cool, I mean. But well, uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm, what did they have? A match, match. Uh, okay, okay, Cupid is, is how yeah. met, right? But, yeah. Because there were websites the, original, the original form of Tinder. Yeah, there was, was the no website, the right? apps. Yep. And, yeah. and check it out, though, man. I always, I always tell her, uh, speaking of that, I go, look, man, I'm gonna fall in love with you just because I spend time around you, and and like that's my brain going, oh, you have to love this person, right? But no, no, no one makes me, and, and by, by 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 virtue of sex, right? Uh, spending time around a person and having sex with them, you'll eventually like feel a similar emotion to love over time. But yeah. no one can make you feel like, and that's why I tell her you have to understand I like you, and that's so much more important. That's such a bigger like. like you can't yeah. make me yeah. like you. Excellent <laughs> you point. Know? Excellent point. Yeah, there, there's a line from a movie. Um, what's the movie called, Ed? Oh. You know what the movie it's on the tip of my tongue. Um Oh fuck. Uh let me look it up. They meet once it's with Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Tell me about Anne Hathaway. Meet Ah I'm getting there. The movie is called One Day and it's about these two friends who you know, it's just sort of like a sappy rom com. But I, I did think it was a good movie. It's about <laughs> these two friends in college, um, and for one day a year they meet and it goes over like 20 years of their friendship oh, wow. they, they like sort of hooked up in college they didn't end up sleeping together but they like made out in college and there's always like a romantic spark kind of and they go in completely separate uh directions and they live in different cities and walks of life but one day every year it's their tradition dexter and emma they meet each other um and you know what one of the lines from the movie anyway is um He's all like, um, I don't know if he's using coconut, but he's all like coked up and drinking, and he's, <laughs> he's sort of becoming. He's this famous like television presenter, like a, a Tucker Carlson type, um, or, or, or not Tucker, like a Ryan Seacrest type guy. Um, and uh, and she says, "I love you, Dex. I just don't like you anymore." Um, <laughs> and then, no, but it's a good look to have this beautiful friendship, and you got to hold your friends accountable. You know, I. I should probably shouldn't say this on a podcast, but the other day I went to hang out with some friends from New York um, who I hadn't seen in a couple of years. I, I, I this is my first time back in America in two and a half years. Okay, um, and one of my friends uh, had just I didn't like the way he was behaving. I didn't really like what he had become, sort of. Um, drinking a lot, uh, doing other things that I didn't approve. I I didn't like the lifestyle that 
that he was leading, and, and not because I didn't approve of it, it or I'm it, judging him it for just it. Didn't. I didn't think it was healthy for him. Yeah. And I didn't think he's my he's my boy, he's my friend, right? And so I'm gonna say to him, I'm going to say, like, man, uh, you know. I don't think this is good for you. I don't think this girl you're dating is particularly good for you. And I think you should you should check yourself a little bit. Um, this is this is headed in not a good direction. Everything about what's going on here, you know, this is a downward spiral. Um, and it only it, it can only end in one of three or four ways, none of which are particularly pleasant. Um, and how do you take but it's that? Hard. I haven't said it to him yet. I'm thinking oh. about it, which is why I'm sitting here hesitating. Well, well, well let, let me, let me, you know. <laughs> I think I'm going to because if you really care about your friends, you know, you gotta hold them accountable for for their shit, you know. And yeah. you have to risk. You have to risk. This is this is going to risk ending the friendship, or uh, and, and, or, or or putting putting a, a wrench into the gears. But I'm willing to accept that risk. Because I think the long-term benefits will, you know, pay off. And one day he'll thank me. Well, you know? not only that, look at it this way. And this is a very simple, um, once I, I adopted this metric and really thought it through, uh, my, my choice on whether I should say something to my friends became incredibly simple. You have to think of it this way. It, whenever your friends are doing something that you don't approve of, and 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 it's you don't approve of it because it's like dangerous or unhealthy, or you think there's a really it's going to turn out really badly, uh, you have to say something to them because uh, if you if you don't, well, one that that will continue with them, but two, they're going to consider you an ally or at the very least. Um, Enabler is probably the wrong word, but it's the closest one I have. Unless you cut them off and stop hanging out. And then they'll be like, oh, man, that guy, uh, fuck him. I, because they don't understand why you left. They don't mm. understand why you cut them off. But if you go and you, you sternly talk to them, uh, you you may, you probably will lose the friendship in the short term. In the long term, if they ever get their head right, you're going to be the person that they think. They, they, they had the balls, and they will appreciate you saying that. One of the things I always talk about with my sobriety is, and, and I don't hold any of my friends accountable, but I'm aware of this. Um, I go, you know, I wish, I just wish somebody at one point sat me down and said, dude, your behavior last night was out of hand, or your drinking's getting out of hand, any like anything, but I never got that. But, and yeah. I don't blame them because that's most people won't do that. But I, but but after I I got right when I saw that behavior in somebody else, I made sure I pointed it out. Because at the end of the day, like you, your time is finite, right? You know, and and you don't want to if you if you can help someone and maintain your time, that I think that's a really good a, a good kind of exchange uh, as it goes. And and the risk is small because think of it, you're not going to be their friend anyway if they're doing that dumb shit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, well, it's true. It got to the point I didn't enjoy being around um, being around this person, this, this behavior. Um, and so uh, that, that you, you, you're right. Um, you either say something or you don't. But if you don't, then you're not going to want to spend time with the person in the first place. So yeah. you, it, it's simple math. Um, look, I want to be respectful of your time, man. I just have a couple more questions. Is that Dude, this all is, right? This has been a great question. The only, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want you to like eat up the whole day. But, but the, yeah. the next thing I'm doing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rehearse my speech. I'm, I'm giving a TED Talk on May 7th. Yeah. And, oh, great. And then I'm also and I'm going to order the, uh, the Dylan White Tyson Fury fight. So, awesome. <laughs> well, before, that, can I get a few more questions in? Before oh, the yeah. Fight? The, 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 fight, the fight's not... Um, Main event's not scheduled till five thirty EST. Is Tyson Fury the Trump guy, the MAGA guy, or is that a different guy? Uh, um, I don't know he's, if he he's said anything. Been... Tyson Fury's a no, no, no. One, one, one of them is he's you know he, he's it's his personality. It's his you know he's it's not WWE. It's his like character. He's always wearing a MAGA hat and he's like oh it's. I... You know, I don't think... I don't know. I don't, fo I, yeah. I don't follow you. I've seen, maybe he's not Fury. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I was watching videos of this little Patty the Fatty. 
the the little blonde guy. He's another UFC fighter uh, or MMA or something. Anyway, whatever. I don't know anything about fighting, <laughs> so we're not going to talk about that because I'm right. going to sound like an idiot. But while we're on the subject of battering other people, um, when is violence justified? You're an army veteran. You're a former heavyweight boxer. You know, some people say self defense. You know, some some guy breaks into your house, whatever. You you got to protect your, your man. Wife and look, kids. I'm look. I just you have a better understanding of violence and the controlled use of violence in something like boxing, um, or you know, in the army. You learn all about how to how to you know combat operations. Um, when is violence justified? Ed? My thought process is. As the initiator of violence is never uh, justified. I, I, I just don't see how. We we don't need it. Now, th- that means then if you're reacting, yeah, if you have to stop somebody from causing harm, if they have broken the, 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 the treaty and they've decided that they're going to initiate violence first, then yeah, you have a, you have a responsibility to be capable of, of defending yourself and stopping the threat and it's unfortunate that that that's why you why i mean you want to talk about why one trains well because there's a lot of evil people in the world man and they're, they're going to take advantage of you and they're going to hurt you if they can and get what they want but if, if you look like you're a, a hard target and you are a hard target then life is going to be a lot different one of the cool things i think about australia is that they they've been able to achieve like no guns, right? Is that 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 more or less accurate? That there are, uh, th- yeah. I mean, yeah. So so that means so yeah. so what that means though is that if somebody, I have no idea like what the fight the street fight culture is in Australia, um, but I know that whatever it looks like, it doesn't escalate to gun gun fight, you know play most of the time. Yeah, in the states. I got to be careful if somebody starts talking out of their ass to me because I'm like, okay, like I'll tell you a story. I was walking in a Best Buy a few years ago and I walked by this dude. Dude must have been like five seven, five eight, maybe 150 pounds wet. And he was with his girl and he looked at me. His girl was dressed like a bit of a hoochie, but he looked at me and was like, yo, what the fuck is you looking at? And my first thought was this dude is like almost half of me and he's going to talk to me like that. He's got a gun. And even if he doesn't, like, what am I going to do? Argue with this kid? But but that changes the dynamic. So you got to, so so violence is never justified as the first initiator. Or as the initiator. First initiator is redundant. Uh, You learn the hard way living living in America that (laughs) um, it's never justified. You should never be initiator to begin with. But also, you know, keep your fucking head down because, or, or, or just say, look, sorry, my bad. I, you know, I, I, I didn't mean to bump into you because you don't know if a guy is strapped. You don't know if, if you don't if know. Anything. It, dude, yeah. it is so crazy because, like, like there's this whole thing that floats around. You know, an armed society is a polite society. I used to really fully believe At, that. In in what society? An armed, armed society is a polite one. Oh, an armed, unarmed society. Yeah, it's and like, and armed, not unarmed. My bad. Uh, I understand. If it's <laughs> the same, it's it's you know mutually assured destruction. Yeah, and, everyone has and, and I I, I get it, that. but yeah. but that that premise relies on sane individuals. It relies on the human being emotionally even killed. and I, I, it it just doesn't work that way, in my opinion. Don't don't. <laughs> Fuck with people. <laughs> it's the message. You, well, well so, look. Sometimes you have to fuck with. Sometimes you have to put your foot down, and say, "Look, man, this this isn't gonna fight." Some guys being weird with a girl in a bar or something. You, yeah, you intervene. But I think the important okay, right. So you you look, just, you just pointed out another one too. That like you know, if if you have to stop, like like a kidnapping or harassment, and the guy, yeah, then you might have to knock somebody out, right? But yeah. like. <laughs> Other than that. Fair enough. Yeah. Protecting yourself at the aggression of others and protecting those who are incapable of protecting themselves. Yeah. You know, or who can't, you know, um, whatever. If I see some guy slip something on a girl's drink, you can bet your ass some slamming his head into the You gotta do something. I mean, that's a, I've never, you know, I've never seen that. I've never been in this situation, (laughs) but I'll get, yeah. 
I don't care if he's seven feet tall. Like you, you got to do. I'll get the, you know, get the security. You got to do something. There, there are situations where you have to intervene. But I think the point that you're making is that um, don't go looking for trouble. Yeah. A lot of people like you had a bad day. Something happened. Don't go looking for trouble. What I mean, I uh, w- one piece of advice that you know I, I I have in work is if you're ever unsure about an email, right? Wait 24 hours. Don't yep. just send it. I send fucking <laughs> I, I send so many emails. I'm a, I'm an editor at a at an international magazine. I email people all the fucking time. You know, people they they send criticism. My when my book came out, it it, it copped a bunch of flack. And it's like, you, you know, you, you want to respond to the haters, or you wanna, you wanna, maybe send uh, whatever. Wait, see how you feel in a day. Not what's what's the harm, you know? Unless there's some crazy deadline, like, um, wait. Yeah. Because oftentimes, and then if you still want to send it, great. But then you're sure that you do. Otherwise, you're gonna send there, kicking yourself. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, this guy, I, I, I write profiles on people. Can, can I can yeah, I pause yeah. you for just a minute? Yeah, yeah, bro. I didn't know that. I just when you said when your book dropped, so I just like went and looked you up. Man, you're like a real badass, man. <laughs> Holy shit! I'm not, I'm just looking reading your uh, author biography. I'm sure, like on on, on Amazon. <laughs> I'm sure that, like, you know, the, the regular listeners know all this, but, wow, man, all these awards, and you, man, you're like, a, like, I think I'm a writer, man, but you, you're a fucking writer, man, like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, uh, thanks, dude. <laughs> Thank you. But, yeah, that, that, I, I just wanted to, like, man, your memoir has got 145 reviews, man. I, my nonfiction ain't, I mean, it's, it's close, but <laughs> that's awesome. Look, if I uh, if I could be a race car driver, maybe I would. But uh, <laughs> this 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 pays the bills, and I enjoy doing it. So, um, but thanks. No, I it means a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Um, no problem. I mean, here's a here's a funny story of 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 waiting 24 hours to send an email, or in this case, physical mail. I write articles um, for tech companies sometimes and you know someone asked me to write up this profile of this guy um and i wrote up the profile of the guy and you know not to be arrogant but this was a great profile this was not an interesting person and i made made him look very interesting i made him look like you know the fucking bee's knees um and he wrote me this nasty email because you know i send the profiles i write of people are generally quite celebratory i'm not a muckraker i don't like do hit pieces on people um maybe the if if one needs to be done like about someone (laughs) who's like hurting other people that's that's one thing but like i don't i don't generally go out trying to make people look bad i wrote this really nice flattering article of it It was it was a portrait of him right for this it doesn't matter who um and it doesn't matter who i was writing it for or who i was profiling um but he sends me this nasty email. This is way too over the top and colorful, and nobody in my industry is gonna like this. This is so boring. It's like nobody in your industry gonna like. It. I sent this to like <laughs> five people in your industry, and they all said it's you know is super cool and interesting and fun. Um, he's just used to writing like boring ad copy all the time, and you know you have you bring in a real writer to write something, and he's like this is you know. Anyway, he had no appreciation for the flair. So, this guy um, is bald. He's completely bald. Um, and he has been for a long time. You look him up on Google, he's nice, shiny head. Um, you know, a bit of a chrome dome situation. And I, upon getting this email to him, was very close to shipping him a bottle of Rogaine. Wow. Um, with, a li- with a little note <laughs> that said, "Sorry, you didn't like my article. Hopefully, this helps." Um, and sending it to him. That's no, that's funny ridiculous. Style, man. Yeah, it's funny, but it's cheeky. It's immature. You know, it shows that I don't take feedback well because I have a you know a public presence on the internet. He has a public presence, 
and so you know we have lots of followers and stuff and, and then it's become a thing and scott newman what do you think what's going to happen it's going to be like scott newman doesn't be... take feedback well or scott scott newman uh can't accept when you know he or he's so he thinks he's such a good writer he can't accept when someone doesn't like it um the truth is like it would have been hilarious and i still might do it in like five or ten years <laughs> but um i just decided like i'm not gonna look this is this is funny as fuck but um probably it's also mean what if the guy's insecure about being bald um i don't know like yeah dude, maybe, you, maybe you know I'll what I, I my girlfriend has really helped me girl fiance you know whatever the woman in my life uh has has really been a great example of that. I watch her do it a lot with emails, and she's not even like, I'm not even close to volatile, but she'll write it out and then go, all right, I'm going to sit on this and come back and make sure this is polite, and then and then get our feedback, and I'll be like, oh yeah, I think that's good, and her sister goes, I think that's good, I might want to change that, but but it really is that's a great example of like getting in between the <laughs> the. The emotion and the response, the stimulus yeah. and the response. Yeah. Um, I also would have... I think Rogaine is prescription only. I'm not sure. So oh, no, nah, man, dude. Check it out. I, it, I, dude, over. I'm I'm like... Uh, I got a great article on this on my site. I'm about yeah. to put another one up. I was like losing a lot of hair. Yeah. I went and get... Yeah, between... I had two hair transplants, and I used Rogaine. I might get one. I got this Widow's Peak situation. Dude, I'm going to get a hair transplant. Does it work? Uh, it doesn't fuck up my fucking hair, man. It's pretty I, good. It, it looks good. My, my look hair is <laughs> straight. And actually, because I wrote the article about it, and and I'm like super persistent with stuff, I um I, I got Bosley. They're gonna give me another one, and they're gonna like link and profile me on their site and everything. And I'm like, oh, that's really great because that you know continues to build the profile and the legend of Ed Lattimore. Don't they graft? Fucking skin off the oh, back dude, of your Oh, dude, here's head. The, check it out, man. This technology is incredible. That's F U T. That that's what they used to do. Now they use F U E. Uh, the the difference is uh, fuck, I can't remember what F U T stands for. What for they like, don't cut skin off the back. They of don't head. cut skin off anymore. They used to do that. Now they use unit extraction. They use a needle that that actually goes and removes the grafts one by one, and they take it all around. One by one. Side. Jeez, Ed, you got millions of. Oh, folks. check it out. How well, long well, does this take? Um, that one day, um, and like twenty four hours in a chair. No, nope. it's like getting a tattoo. Nope. Seven a.m. to the first time where they took more graphs. They took sixteen hundred graphs and moved them. Uh, that was so precise. That was like oh fifteen. That, that was like not fifteen hours. Uh, from seven to like five, and then the second one I went where they took fourteen hundred, a little less. That was like seven to two. Yeah, uh, right. but dude, it, it's quick, man. He, 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 because the technology is just so awesome now. Yeah, and and the third one is just gonna round out and fill in, and yeah. and they, you know, I'm I'm really impressed by it. And dude, I'm telling you, you want to talk about one of those things? Like you're, I I, I don't say this condescendingly at all, but I just gotta Please. make sure I preface it. Go ahead. You're you're still at the age where everyone looks young. Like like you yeah. know, whenever you meet yeah. somebody and you guess their age. If you think they're about your age, you're generally right, right? Mm. At 37, <laughs> when I guess someone's age, yeah, uh, because I think they look like because because I think I've, I've maintained myself very well. Uh, they're usually your age, yeah. Uh, but when I think someone is is my age now, when I think someone is in their 30s, they oh. tend to be like like not in their 30s, so. It, it's, they tend it's, to be it, up. They're like, well, they're older. You mean? Yeah, yeah. People because people don't work out and losing hair, and so I I, I take care of the one I could control working out and mm. losing hair. I just just went and got it back, and it's it's yeah. what's it was. It's my favorite investment. And I actually read this book a while ago, Cyber uh, Psycho Cybernetics, and he talks Psycho about Psycho Cybernetics. Who yeah, it? Uh, Maxwell something. I can't remember his name, but Ma he. You, you can probably look it right up, up. Yeah. yeah. But he, but uh, at the start, he talks about some research that shows that the one uh, most people, whenever there's a life change, their their happiness tends to bounce back. Mm. Or like like if it goes down, it tends to go back where it was, and if it goes up, it tends to come back. Like making a bunch of money, having a kid, changing jobs, things like that. 
The one thing that produces a permanent change, apparently, is any type of cosmetic enhancement. Mm. So if you went and got like plastic surgery, all right, um, permanent enhancement. Getting my hair, but then permanent you, enhancement. You mean emotion, emotionally? Yeah, emotionally. Like I feel like because because I because I, I don't I never look and go. Uh, right now, I'm, I look at it every day and I'm like, oh, I'm so happy I made enough money to do this. Like, yeah. that's my, my thought process. No, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good metaphor. Is like, you know, I was reading a thing on people. They spend all this time doing shit that you know they don't want to. Like, I guess the point of the article was pay someone to clean your house. Pay someone to do yeah. if you have enough money. If you if if, if you can afford it, right? Um, stretch a little bit, you know, maybe order a couple less gin and tonics on the weekend and pay someone to clean your house, pay someone to do your laundry, pay someone to do the shit that you really don't fucking like doing. And now there are people who love doing laundry and people who love cooking or whatever. But if you want to cooking, actually, I think you should do yourself because, then, oh, yeah. you know, for so like... but, but like, <laughs> the, 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 the point, the point is, um, when you... You should pay money to enhance your life in some way, in ways that enable, that like make you feel, but they give you more time to do podcasting and writing. Or yep. if this hair thing, like, makes you feel better, yeah, fucking dude, out. it like, makes me it. Like, like, dude, I was on, um, I was on a, a pretty popular show last, well, actually earlier this week, and, and I'm looking at myself on YouTube, and I'm like, yeah, I look yeah. Really cool. Right, like That's I don't look sick. like I'm lo- like I'm losing hair and all sick. So no, dude, I, I I highly recommend it to every guy. I'm very open about it. Like some guys are like, I don't want people to know. They're like, no, nah, fuck that. But I, no, I, I'll I'll shout about it from the rooftops because because it, it's really uh, awesome. And I and I didn't think it would make that much of a difference in anything. But but I know because I can see pictures that that I look objectively better. Like yeah, not even a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. I I think, and then, you know, I, I don't know. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, I don't fucking want to waste a day in the chair. But it's not wasting. It's a permanent improve. It's this other thing. Is is like. Yeah, um, it's pretty. It's permanent. Like like these hairs. It's, it's permanent. It's like getting a tattoo. I was in the chair for eight hours. I have a huge wolf on my leg. The face oh. of a wolf. It's like half realistic, half uh, mandala. And, uh, you know, it, was, it hurt a lot. I was in the chair for a while. But. I fucking love the look of it. Dude, I look at it all the time. I'm like, this is sick. <laughs> and, um, and check it out. Here's the other thing. I, I, I want to make sure I make this clear. It's your hair graft move. So this hair grows. Like, it's not just sitting there. I got to go get a haircut. No, but... it's not a It's not a toupee. It's, it's, nope, it's, that is it's my hair. The f- mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm happy that you've taken ownership of the hair. I mean, it, it's yours. Yeah. Um, Ed, all right, let's go through... Uh, actually, you know what? This is important. This is the last big question. And okay, then last we'll big question. Last, last big question. One thing you write a lot about is, you know, victimhood mentality and breaking out of victimhood mentality. Um, it's, it's very easy and appealing for, you know, to just sort of point the figure saying the the world is unfair and a lot of like the world is unfair and it's cruel and it's indifferent and you had it you know you had it rougher than than most growing up and yet you know look at what you've done you've, you've built this great life for yourself so my question for you is that one thing i find to be especially cruel and unfair is to tell young people like teenagers, uh, particularly young black teenagers, that like no matter how hard they work, what they accomplish, um, you know how much effort they put in, the system will always be stacked against them. Now it's being told to you know like LGBTQ kids as well. It's this. I mean, a lot of young people today are they're 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 sort of told that. The world is out to get them and there's nothing they can do about it and they they shouldn't even try because the system is so disproportionately stacked against them and one of the things i really like about what you write is you acknowledge yes some things in the world are out of your control some things in the world are shitty but like what are you going to do about it you know tend to your own garden bootstrap your way up I don't know. Talk, talk to me a little bit about this. I mean, it's a running theme that I see in your tweets and your uh, Instagram posts. Yeah, online. man. Because here's the thing. And one of the things that I realized 
early on is that no one's coming to save me. And and I and I recognize that and I know that uh once what once I recognized that no one was coming to save me, then I could decide, okay, do we want to stay in this life or do we want to get a better one? But but that recognition let me or allowed me to formulate ways to make it happen. I wasn't sitting around waiting for, for a thing to change and I would not complain. I've never been a complainer. I never will be. And, and I would not just be passive in my life it made me an active participant in in my future but it all comes from seeing initially that no one was ever going to be there for me and and i don't think that response is normal i I was talking to somebody about this yesterday that i'm i'm a great example of a survivor's bias if if you look at how things have gone my way and people go oh look at what ed has done with his life why don't you do the same thing? And I got, and then I look back, man, because I still got some family in that area, and I and I, I see it, and I'm just like, it, it, I, if only it was as easy as being me. Like you, can, but you're not gonna be me. You're not gonna replicate me. You're not gonna replicate my reactions. But that doesn't mean you can't take my mindset. And that is a, the most important thing. The that mindset of ownership of owning the the outcome that's that's all i did is as i i know that or i knew that you know nothing was ever going to be given to me uh, I, I experienced too much lack to believe otherwise i never got a chance to really just believe that life was all hunky-dory like kids do uh, and so i was confronted with reality really early mm. so so being confronted with reality that makes you <laughs> you, you you ever see a matrix this is one of my favorite analogies man and and that scene when cypher's trying to go back in the matrix mm. and he's like you know i'm tired of this i want food to taste like food you know and stuff like that he he wants to believe the lie because the lie is really comfortable mm. right it, it's a lot more comfortable than the truth but I never got a chance to embrace the lie, man. And, and that's just, just where it goes. And one of the pieces of advice of advice I give people is is that you have to not you have to develop an unflinchingly close relationship with the reality of your situation. If if you do that, you've got a pretty good chance of changing it. But until you get out of delusion, you don't know what even what to attack. You don't even know mm. what to do. That's the real danger of, of that. Uh, delusion is that you you don't you never pay attention to the real enemy. This is a great point. This is an excellent so. point. Um, all right, Ed, favorite movie? Man on Fire. Man on Fire. Favorite book? Oh man, F- fiction or nonfiction? Both. <laughs> favorite nonfiction book is A Course in Miracles, Todd with Art of Learning by Josh Whitesky. A Course in Miracles is about forgiveness. Favorite fiction book I've read so far. Uh, I'm, I'm really digging Elmore Leonard stuff. Uh, mm. Elmore Leonard and 310 to Yuma has been pretty good. Uh, that's a short story, full book, probably Michael Crichton's Power of Latitudes. Mm-hmm. Cool. Best piece of advice you've been given? I've been given. Yeah, uh, not that you've <laughs> that you've been given. Uh, my, my coach. Any, any time in your life. Oh, uh, dude, I, I'll tell you, the, my coach, my boxing coach said to me, um, when we were training and just, you know, sticking to it and just being miserable. He said, good things take a while. Bad things bad things happen quickly. Good things tend to take a while. That's powerful and true. As you've been yeah. in the fucking boxing gym, <laughs> being, you know, in life, working towards your career, good things take a while. They, yeah. they really do. <laughs> All right. Well, Ed Lattimore, thank you so much for coming on to 27 Roosh. It's been a pleasure. Hey, no problem, man. No problem.